Thank you for visiting Harvest Anglican Church. We're so glad that you're here. We hope that you're blessed by this message, and we hope that you can join us next time we gather. So be sure to look at our website, harvestsc.org, and find the next worship event and join us. God bless you. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, to read, to mark, to learn, and to inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. There you go. There you go. I know it's kind of a rainy, sleepy day. Um, and that, honestly, the, the scripture readings are a bit sobering this morning. Amen. Uh, this is kind of a silly example, but I remember when my sons, they're monstrously huge now. I've got twin 17-year-old twin boys that are about my size. But back when they were about half my size, <laughs> I remember uh, one of my sons having to forgive somebody in elementary school for not throwing a ball to him on the playground. You remember that? No, <laughs> I didn't think so. You know, I, I'm not, I don't want to make light of what kids have to do to forgive each other because that's certainly important. It was certainly important for my son to forgive somebody who didn't throw a ball on the, on the playground, right? I saw a video this past week almost showed of this kid who had to forgive his sister for throwing him into the deck, you know. And we, kids have to forgive each other also. But as we grow older, right, situations tend to get more serious at times. And so the grace that we will need from God to forgive those who hurt us is enormous. We all know this. I think that's why Peter came up to Jesus saying, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? The Jewish rabbis in those days typically said to forgive somebody three times. Kind of like we say today when we say three strikes and you're out, buddy. Peter goes for broke here. Maybe he's trying to impress Jesus. I don't know. But he says, how many? Seven times? Twice what the rabbis say? And a little bit more than twice? And Jesus says, nope. How about 77 times? Which prepares us, I believe, to feel, listen, the weight of our own sinfulness. And to feel more deeply, maybe to appreciate more God's infinite mercy and His costly love toward us, which we are called to imitate. Anyway, a little side note here. The numbers... Seven and 77 times. It's actually an interesting throwback and reversal of an Old Testament consequence. Okay? Found in Genesis chapter 4. God laid a consequence on Cain. Anybody remember Cain? The son of Adam and Eve who committed the first murder ever recorded, killed his brother. It's an interesting reversal of this. God gave Cain consequences for his heinous crime because there are consequences for sin, okay? God is a God of justice as well as a God of mercy. So God told Cain that he would be a wanderer all the days of his life and that his work would be toil and trouble. And then Cain responds to the Lord and says, it's too much. It's too much for me. I'll be away from your presence, Lord. And people will not only do that, but they'll try to kill me. To which the Lord in His mercy said, not so. Actually, anyone who tries to hurt you will have consequences seven times. And get this. 
I want to get even weirder. The strange great, 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 great grandson of Cain named Lamech. Right? Appears later in Genesis 4. And guess what? This is a, a really good family line here because he kills somebody too. This time time, God is strangely silent though. Maybe it's just because it's right before Genesis 6 where he floods the whole world for its wickedness. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, check this out. Lamech says this. I have killed a man for wounding me. I've killed a man, a young man for striking me. And I want to stop there for a minute because you remember the Beatitudes? What does Jesus say when somebody strikes you on the cheek? Let him strike you on the other cheek as well. You see this? This is amazing. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge, he says, is sevenfold, then Lamex, Lamex is seventy, what? Sevenfold. <laughs> Do you think seven and seventy-seven have a place in our story today, in our gospel? It's definitely tied in. Okay? And the bottom line is this. I want to ask God what all that weird story about the mech and all that really means that one day when I see him. But the bottom line is, is that just as Cain's descendants responded with unlimited vengeance, so we as Christians are to respond to sin with limitless forgiveness. It's not three strikes you're out for us. It's not even double that. It's not the divine number of seven. Okay? It's not even 77 times. That was hyperbole. That was just Jesus saying it's basically an infinite amount we are to forgive. You know, all of us in here have probably been hurt deeply, backstabbed by someone. I don't care what age you are, young or old. You all know what I'm talking about. Some of us in here have been betrayed and hurt at the deepest levels imaginable. And one of the things, big or small, one of the most difficult callings, make no mistake, as Christians and what we tend to struggle with the most ever since Genesis 3 and the fall of mankind is forgiveness. It's forgiving those who hurt us. It's the most difficult challenge sometimes for us. But the truth is, as our text last week talked about, if you have a red letter Bible, all the words today are written in red. Which means Jesus is speaking to us. And he is clearly right telling us to forgive. As much as it honestly pains us, we don't have an option. Verse 33. Should you not have had mercy as I had mercy? Think about the Beatitudes again. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I saw a quote from Anne Graham Watts this week. She says, If Jesus forgave those who nailed him to the cross, and if God forgives you and me, how can you withhold your forgiveness? From somebody else. Now if you were here last week. You might be thinking. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus said that there was a time. To cut communion from somebody in the church. Did Jesus contradict himself here? I can answer that in one second. Ready? One. No. Good enough? <laughs> Simply, if you weren't here, verses 15 through 20 last week, 
It tells us how to address the problem of serious sin in the community, in the church. Following, mind you, a very diligent and fair and graceful discipline process where everybody is aware at every single step, okay, that Jesus is in their midst. Okay? Today's verses and today's parable focuses on how we should, as Christians, respond to a brother or sister who sins against us personally. Personally. And here's the thing. Going back again to last week, because these, these, these two weeks are very, very tied to each other. Even when we have to do the worst and do excommunicate somebody for being unrepentant, did Jesus or Paul that we talked about last week, his, his verses to the Corinthian church, did they ever say not to forgive that person? No. Not at all. In fact, if you remember our passages, Old Testament passages last week, God's heart clearly is for those people to repent from their wicked ways and to live. Remember I told you last week, I remember I reminded us of the prodigal son story or the story of the loving father that God loves to welcome home sinners. So people who hurt us, they they need our forgiveness. They need our prayers so that they amend their ways and come back to the Lord. But our pronouncement of forgiveness for somebody who has hurt us is not only for their sake. It's for ours as well. And this is where the hard work of Christianity comes in. Because listen carefully. A heart that's unforgiving, is, that's bitter, is a cancer in your soul. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous to your soul, as we heard today. Matthew's Gospel, the King and His Kingdom... Is the theme is very, very difficult. Because his gospel is fraught with as much encouragement and grace and mercy and story of resurrection and new life as it is with serious warning. Serious warning. And hopefully today that has become very, very clear because we have been shown infinite mercy. And so how can we withhold mercy? Now I've heard it said that a bitter heart or unforgiveness is like drinking poison yourself. It's a cancer. You're wanting the person who hurts you to to feel your hurt, right? You're wanting them to beg for forgiveness because of the hurt they've caused you. But most of the time, let me just tell you, they're not even thinking about you. They don't even have one single thought. And here you are killing yourself over the anguish that they've caused you. God doesn't want that for you. He's trying to set us free from prison, y'all. I need to make this clear also. God is not calling us Right? To continue to be a doormat for somebody who's abusing us. That is very, very clear. He's not even saying we have to stay in relationship with that person. But we must forgive. As Warren Wearsby said, I saw this is a great quote, the world's worst prison is the prison of an unforgiving heart. So let it go. Forgive. As verse 35 says, forgive from your heart. 
which is the innermost core. And this is hard, isn't it? Let's be real. I mean, this is the hardest thing that some of us will ever have to do. You know, I've heard this section of text is called Jesus' Sermon on the Congregation because of how it parallels, as we've already talked about, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? which is in chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel. This is hard. Jesus' teaching is radical. It's, it's upside down from the world. Opposite of the Genesis 3 world where we take vengeance upon people. Right? Those of us who have been in South Carolina for a while never forget the uh, story. I, I think it was about seven or eight years ago at this point. But Mother Emmanuel Church in Charleston. You all remember that shooting? Dylan, I don't even want to say his name, entered that church in a Bible study and actually stayed with them for a while. And then he turned and killed them. But I'll never forget how that church responded. People came into Charleston to protest and the church gathered in the street to sing hymns. At the trial of Dylan Roof, Family members who'd lost ones at his evil hand forgave him publicly in the trial. It's indescribably hard, it's costly to love. Isn't it? And honestly, church, that's why I'm so grateful that we have our loving Savior, Jesus. For we don't serve a God who says, forgive, but He didn't ever do it Himself. Jesus said to the very people He created, who whipped Him and who spit in His face, And put a crown on his head. Thorns mocking him and nailing him to a cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So we have a tall task church but thank you God we have Jesus we have the Holy Spirit we have the church to help us and to encourage us so that we become more like Jesus Verse 23, Jesus tells us a parable. And I'm going to go quickly here because I feel like God's already spoken so much truth. But we're going to go line by line here. Verse 23, he says, therefore. And this is Jesus speaking. So whenever there's that word therefore, it means sit up. Pay attention. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. What's the title of our series? The king and his kingdom. Who's the king? Alluded to here. Jesus. Jesus. And so the king wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one of the servants was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, talent is not a musical ability or music or ability to play basketball here, okay? It's an ancient sum of money. And 10,000 talents was a huge sum of money. In today's terms, it would be unpayable. Like our national debt. Sorry. 
I heard somebody say today it's like a it's an equivalent of a hundred and sixty eight thousand years of work in that day. How much has the Lord forgiven us? Because we are to put ourselves in the place of that servant who was coming before the king. Verse 26, so the servant fell on his knees, imploring the king, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Yeah, right. Is he going to pay 168,000 years of work back? How much have we been forgiven? But out of pity for him, the master of that servant, again, think of the magnitude of the weight of the number that he owed. The master of that servant released him and forgave him of that massive, massive debt. That should have changed his heart, right? You would think that would make an impact. But what, what does the servant do? That servant, verse 28, same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, that's an infinitely smaller amount. It's still a lot. It's like a hundred days wages, but it's still, compared to 168,000 years of work, it's a, it's a lot different. Jesus is contrasting here. And he goes out and finds his friends like, give me that, what you owe? Chokes him. Sorry, brother, I don't mean to come at you like that. He'd just been forgiven all that debt. And he goes out and chokes somebody who owes him a hundred denarii. And what happens? His fellow servant also falls down and pleads with him, saying the exact same thing that he told the, the king. Have mercy on me. Patience with me and I will pay you. He doesn't listen. He refuses. And he put him in prison until he should pay his debt. Verse 31, when his fellow servants saw all that had taken place, they were greatly distressed. Other translations say they were mad. They were grieved. They were outraged. See, unforgiveness not only destroys you, it also destroys relationships around you. The fallout is huge. And the consequences are lasting. And so they go and tell the king. They basically tell on him. And here in, in, here in this, continuing in verse 32, the master resummoned the original servant and said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had the same mercy on your fellow servant that I had on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers. Some translations say the torturers. Until he should pay all his debt. Then the real kicker. Jesus says, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Do you think he ever got out of that jail? You think he ever repaid it? So lovingly I say to you, and I say to myself, I say to all of us, this is not a misprint. It's not a, it doesn't need a revision. It's God's eternal truth. Jesus is the Word made flesh. And He is the King. And He means what He says. And again, it doesn't mean that we have to stay in relationship with people and be a doormat to those who continue to abuse or anything like that. But just as the unforgiving servant was handed over, so here today will the unforgiving spouse, the unforgiving parent, the unforgiving sibling, the unforgiving employee, the unforgiving church member, if we do not forgive from our heart. 
I saw a quote recently. It said, if Christianity is all about forgiveness, where are all the Christians? Ponder that a moment. And honestly, if you struggle with forgiveness like I do sometimes, and we all do, I encourage you to read the Psalms. Seriously, take note of that. If you struggle with forgiveness, I encourage you to read the Psalms. Because they are prayers that help us vent with the Lord. Honestly. When I struggle, I go there. To vent with God, but demanding that He do justice, to air my dirty laundry, so to speak, and then to ask Him to wash me clean and to change my heart. A perfect example is Psalm 139. Listen to this vent. David says, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Sounds pretty vengeful, doesn't it? But listen to this. The psalmist turns from this line of thinking. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And in, in other words, take it, Lord. Take my vengeful thoughts. I'm sorry for my thoughts. They are leading me to death. And I want to walk in the way of life. Forgiveness is a rarely a one-time event. Remember, 77 times. Right? And for most of us, it's going to be a long process of sanctification through the means of grace, through the Spirit, through the sacraments, and through each other as the church. So please, church, don't get discouraged. Just keep looking to Jesus and strive and strive and strive. And with the help of God and with the help of each other, the church, we will, I love what James, he who began a good work in you will see it to completion. As much as the New Testament so much says, strive to put to death all anger and malice and hatred and instead forgive as the Lord, your heavenly Father, has forgiven you. Ephesians is full of that. Colossians 3, all that. So we have to listen to the King and find life everlasting in His name. Some of us, again, have legitimate wounds, things that have happened to you, and you may be saying to yourself, how do I forgive that which seems impossible for, to forgive? Look to the cross. And our Savior upon it. Who bore the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, I think the deepest reason we struggle with forgiveness is perhaps we have forgotten how much Jesus has forgiven us at the cross and at His table. That's why I'm so grateful for our Eucharistic tradition. Because every single week we are reminded when we see, when we smell, when we hear, when we taste what God has done for us at great cost to Himself as we receive His body broken and His blood shed for us. I pray that today is the day for you, for all of us. If you have anything in your heart that is killing you for lack of forgiveness, bring it to Jesus today. He doesn't want you imprisoned anymore. He wants you free. He wants to lead you in the way everlasting. Amen. Let today be the day that you come to Jesus anew. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.